Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds. I have the distinct pleasure and honor to present uh, two colleagues who um, I've worked with over uh, several years. Uh, first, Dimitri Levin, uh, one of our own here from the University of Washington, uh, majored in chemistry and Russian lit. We met about um, <clears throat> a number of years ago and uh, initially started uh, <laughs> at the Seattle Science Foundation working together and then uh, we both moved over here in about 2013. And um, I think um, he's truly a model of, uh, of what uh, someone aspirational can do at the University of Washington, frankly. We came really with very little in terms of uh, materials and, um, and, and, and support. And um, we were able to uh, generate support from Bob McClellan, from Bill Bremner, from the Department of Medicine. And uh, you'll see some of the absolute spectacular work that he's been able to do. More recently, uh, Beth Ripley has joined us. Beth originally got most of her education in California. I wish I didn't read her CV. I feel a little more comfortable talking to her now. Um, but she started at UCSD, then went to Stanford, spent some time at Harvard. Uh, then we were fortunate enough to have her here at the University of Washington. She's an assistant professor of radiology and really um, has been an absolute spectacular partner uh, to, to the program at the Center for Cardiovascular Innovation. So with that, um, again, just <clears throat> work that um, the two of them have really uh, started from the most nascent beginnings uh, in 3D printing and virtual planning for clinical care innovation, will be presented today here at Graham Rounds. Uh, thank you both for doing this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eastman. Uh, so what we'd like to do over the next hour or so is uh, to talk about some of the other imaging modalities that are out there that can sort of add on to the clinical care pathways that we have currently. And we'll specifically focus on the cardiac pathways uh, and what could be added. So here's the two disclosure slides, one for me and uh, one for Dr. Ripley. And then kind of going into it, I think one of the highlights that we we'll wanna make is that what has been done clinically from the educational teaching training perspective as well as just the clinical care hasn't really changed that much. This is a slide that a lot of you have seen the beginning of the 20th century, but then if we jump forward to not so long ago, it's kind of the same. Nothing has really changed that much. Um, and what we realized as we looked at that pathway is kind of where do we start and where do we end, and where can we help along the way with some of the clinical innovation that's happening on the device side of things, as well as the more complicated anatomies that you're trying to target. So from CCVI perspective, Center for Cardiovascular Innovation that we started in 2015 over here, we sort of started out with a bit of just relearning of the anatomy and educating ourselves, but as well as the community around us to talk about what is cardiac anatomy and what is a cardiac anatomy really in this day and age versus what it was 50 years ago. And then we jump forward and created some of the perfusion models that allow us to take a look at the valves in situ, deploy some of the valves, and then better understand what is the relational anatomy and what are the interactions that are happening between the different valves and pathways um, and some of the complications that could occur. And then we try to jump forward a little bit more and then add some of the clinical tools that you have, such as fluoroscopy or ultrasound, and use them in conjunction with the anatomical models that we kind of currently have. And along the way, I think what we realized is that there's a lot of this imaging out there, and we're not 100% sure whether we understand what it really means or how it really functions, and uh, trying to kind of better understand how does that translate into clinical care and what else can we unlock and uh, create. And with that, probably around 2015 is when I met Dr. Ripley, and we started thinking about 3D printing or other things that could be added on and what could be done with that data set that really exists in two dimensions, but we work in three dimensions. So I'll let you take over for a second. Sure. So one of the fun things about being a radiologist is sitting in the dark, of course, um, but really trying to take all of these complicated 3D image data sets and look at them in two dimensions. And it's actually really challenging to do. And to uh, show that, we're gonna go through a little case here. 
Um, and I know there, you guys are not radiologists and, and very savvy, so I've given you four axial slices of some anatomy here. And if anyone in the audience knows what it is for sure, raise your hand. There may or may not be a prize. May or may not, but it could be a Well, so I only gave you axial. So I'm going to be nice. I'll give you sagittal. So now you've got four more images. You've got axial. You've got sagittal. Anyone know for sure? Okay. All right. All right. I'll be nice, and I'll give you three more. I got three. Now we should just be able to compute this. Right? So we've got the axial, the sagittal, the triangle. So just put it all together. Anyone? Someone's got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I won't call on you, but I'll see. We'll check you afterwards. <laughs> All right, come up for your major award afterwards. Okay. Does anyone know what this is? If you know what that is, raise your hand. Right? Okay. No, if you go back, right? Okay. See, I'm gonna give you an eyeball. And, and we all know what that is, and, and that's what it's kind of about. Like, okay, so now I can teach you to read alligators, right? Like now, next time, I can't trick you, I can't use this slide, but we don't see it unless we learn how to see it in two dimensions. Um, but when we see it in three dimensions, we all know what that is. I mean, we could argue is that an alligator or a crocodile, right? That would be the debate, but it's an alligator. It's from Florida. Um, but, and why? So I started thinking about this, and a lot of us, when we But it turns out that our brains are actually wired to look at three dimensions. And not even just three dimensions on a screen, but true three dimensions. So we've got neurons that are tuned that are recognizing these certain shapes and objects that you see in 3D, in real 3D. And those neurons are firing because of that. And so really, if you look at the knobs, so basically what I've gotten down to is, Sure, I can look at it in the 2D, you can look at it in the 2D, but it's really something that bother me. The next step of this kind of equation that we try to all um, go along. So what happens clinically? There's one part of the imaging and there's one part of the actual clinical care that you're providing for each one of the patients. And what is the challenge here? Well, the challenge is not just the three-dimensional anatomy, the challenge is also the communication. When you're talking about the same patient, the imager, the interventionalist, the um, anesthesiologist, they all might be coming from a different perspective and a different training as well as a surgeon. So how do we bring everyone on the same page and make sure that when one person is referring to an interior part of the anatomy, the other one doesn't think it's lateral and create that complication along the way? So there are several cases that we've had in the beginning, and really those cases were not simple cases that we might be doing right now. So again, this is an example of a three-dimensional or two-dimensional imaging that's been translated into the three dimension. In this example, I'm sure you might recognize some of it uh, and what case this is, but this is a patient who had an interrupted IVC, and for that particular patient, the target was a mitral valve. So we were trying to come up with a pathway of how to deliver that transcatheter mitral valve, how to get there, but also how to get there safely and how to address it. The advantages of having that three-dimensional anatomy and three-dimensional image physically in your hands was the fact that you can rotate it and look at it from a perspective that you are interested in, but you're also able to practice along the way and see what catheters to use, what pathways to take, and whether that's going to be a successful procedure, you might have to rethink how to address it. Now, how do we get there? Overall, there is a fairly standard pathway of getting from the DICOM data set that you're used to on the clinical side to this physical model that we create. And traditionally, what happens is we start with the DICOM two-dimensional slices, whether that be CT, MRI, uh, TEE, or even EP maps, and then we translate that anatomy by doing the segmentation. And essentially what segmentation does, it selects the parts that we want versus the parts that we don't want. So let's say if we just want the heart, we're gonna select the heart, but we're not gonna select the ribs. And then what happens is we create this volumetric file that the machine, the 3D printer can actually recognize 
and then create an image with it. And then we'll go ahead and translate it over uh, to a three-dimensional printer. And then the three-dimensional printer will actually make that physical model for us. Um, and it could take anywhere from minutes to hours, depending on the complexity of it. And what we've done is early on is, as Dr. Ripley likes to say, we kind of focused on zebras. Yeah. yeah, so I think <clears throat> early on we thought about how do we do the most complex cases? You know, so 3D printing with conjoined twins, um, you know, really crazy congenital uh, problems that we didn't understand well. And, you know, some of the, the first work we did and work that I did with um, Dimitri was looking at all of these complex congenital cases from around the world. So this case actually came from United Arab Emirates. And it's one of the interesting things about 3D printing and digital medicine is that we can collaborate. So we did a lot of cases in uh, the UAE and other places abroad. Um, this is some great work from Josh Hermson, who is here and has sadly left us and gone to uh, the other UW. But um, he's a fantastic surgeon. And he, this is not necessarily a zebra, but uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a tough case. Uh, you don't get to operate on a lot. And he came up with this strategy to not only 3D print, but practice. So he's actually in here operating on a 3D printed heart. And you can see here the pieces that he's taken out from the septum um, in this HCM procedure and then the actual patient specimen. And then he kicked it up another notch by giving residents a chance to do it. So one of these was done by the resident and one was done by him. So this is what the resident took. This is, again, we're looking at the, uh, the intraventricular septum and the color is showing how much uh, of that wall the resident took. And this is what uh, Josh took. So he was able to debrief with the, with the resident beforehand um, and let him into the case. But then, you know, Zebras are good, uh, but we really wanted to make a more profound impact because, again, when we go back, we still have the alligator problem, right? We still have this issue that's really hard to see things we don't know. Um, and we still have what I call the Tower of Babel problem, right, which is we're all speaking different languages, talking about anatomy and where it is. So how could we drive what we had learned um, early on into a larger impact? Oh, well, I, actually, this is still mine. Yeah. So. <laughs> So for me, I, I did a, a fellowship for uh, cardiovascular imaging and TAVR was like the nightmare, right? The TAVR Tuesdays. And we'd have to measure all of this, these measurements. And we weren't sure, and this is early on, were we making the right measurements or not? So we're making tons of measurements and looking at it different ways and trying to give uh, our cardiology colleagues all these different numbers. And so finally I said, why don't we just print it? It'll make life easier. So this was the concept. like you know, just print it, stick a valve in there, um, test it out and see if it fits. And so this was some of our first work. And you can see we could actually make um, pretty good 3D prints here that have coarse calcifications and flexible leaflets that match with the anatomy. Um, and that, that sort of eased us into this area. And Dimitri is gonna show, I mean, Taver, now you all have it kind of down, but there are other challenging areas. I think this is exactly the translation that we'll want to make from the maybe more simpler cases that you're more used to, such as TAVR, to maybe something more complicated, such as a valve and valve, where you're doing a redo of something that maybe was done correctly or incorrectly. And you're trying to figure out what is the anatomy, what does it look like, or maybe even as simple as, well, what is the valve that I'm going to be working with because I don't have any record of what it is. And it's important to have that three-dimensional anatomy and understand what is the relationship between the native valve, the mitral valve that's under it, the coronaries that are above it, and how do you address it? And frankly, maybe what is the device that you want to use to be able to address it safely, <coughs> excuse me, and properly. Another example is a Watchman procedure. Although it seems as a fairly simple thing to do, when you start adding up and looking at different patient populations, maybe it's not as simple as it is, and it's maybe less about the actual device deployment, and more about the pathway and how you get there and doing the transeptal puncture, selecting the right catheter and really figuring out what is gonna be the best outcome uh, when it comes down to that. But when you start to get into the reality of it, all of this anatomy is different and all of the measurements into 
Yep, and that's uh, as simple as it is. It's a question of are we measuring on CT or are we measuring on ultrasound? Are we measuring in the systolic or diastolic phase? And what are really the meaningful measurements that need to be made? And that's part of the, again, communication process between whoever is doing the imaging to whoever is doing the procedure. Now, when you think about the three dimensional anatomy and creating those. 3D models, whether they be virtual or physical, I think we need to consider another thing is how do we change or augment that anatomy along the way, maybe by doing something that we weren't supposed to be doing. And this is part of the quality management system that we're instituting throughout the 3D printing, where it comes from moving from the digital map, which is the DICOM and really the gold standard that we're going to refer to, versus the physical model that we're going to give to your physician and say, look, this is the anatomy, and now you can base your decision off of that, but really you need to go back to that original DICOM data set that's required if any of your care is going to change based on the decisions that you've made within that three-dimensional model. Yeah, I think at this point we said, okay, so we have understand that there's an alligator problem, 2D to 3D. We understand that there's a communication problem. We think that there's utility for this, and we start to print. Um, and give these to our surgical cardiology and interventional colleagues, but are we giving you really good data? You know, how good is it? And so this is where we took a step back as a center and said, let's do the hard work of, of learning kind of from our manufacturing colleagues about verification, validation, making sure we've got the right thing. So we uh, leverage the fact that we do have an amazing cadaveric uh, tissue collection here to take cadaveric hearts, CT scan them, 3D print them, and then do head-to-head -head comparisons so that we knew how accurate we were on the data. And this is some of that early work um, that we did. Josh Hermson was a big part of this, Moses Mather too. Um, both have gone on to other areas, great work. Uh, but we found that, interestingly, we can indeed get accuracy within, you know, plus or minus a millimeter, which is right around the, the limits of the imaging. So we're, I guess to say it another way, we're really bound by the imaging um, resolution, not the 3D printing resolution. So this made us feel better about moving forward. Uh, we actually published a paper on some of the verification steps and, and looking into this. This is stuff we can, we can talk about more. So it's not as exciting. So we will Kind of move on, but uh, this is something that is very important and that we spend a lot of time on. And then also thinking about how do we report out. So this is an example of one of the reports that we use over uh, at the VA. So again, kind of like imaging, we've got who the doctor is, what we've made the model from, what it's being used for, uh, what the anatomy is, what the colors mean, and then we do quality checks. So I have to sign off my life here that this is accurate and take responsibility for the data. But I think that's a very important thing because you want to trust this just like any other medical imaging data. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me, what, are we, <coughs> what have we done so far? So, so far roughly started about 2015, maybe 2016 as we started playing around with the 3D printing, and there was a very limited number of cases that we've done at that time, maybe two, three cases or so. Up to this point, including almost to the end of this year, without some of the cases that we haven't completed yet, we've done about 223 cases. We Those did, are part Correct. So we did about 15 cases in 2017, we did about 48 cases in 2018, and we've already done 160 cases in 2019. So that kind of gives you the perspective of maybe where this is going and how we can be better helpful for what you're trying to do clinically. And I want to look at those cases if we do a little bit of a case breakdown. Uh, we've done 198 cases in conventional cardiology, 15 cases in thoracic surgery, four cases in the PE, and six cases from the anesthesia perspective. The anesthesia part has been driven by Dr. Mackinson. And then uh, looking at those cases, really it's a large breakdown of what we have done, but the big two driving factors are the cases that maybe physicians have the most questions about, which are TMVR, transcatheter mitral valve replacement, and LAA, which is the Watchman device for left atrial appendage occlusion, as well as some of maybe more noble approaches, such as the bicuspid aortic valves and their treatment, the TABR when it comes down to the valve and valve and congenitals, the Apical axis that Dr. McCabe does, 
and others such as the TVL, ASD, PFO, and sort of the maybe not as large of a numbers of cases, but could be potentially challenging cases, as well as we've done several of the congenital cases as well. When it comes to how long it takes us to do some of the cases, Overall, it's widely dependent, uh, and that is dependent on the degree of the anatomy complexity, as well as the degree of what is the data sets that we're getting. But if we kind of break it down uh, per case and on average, and if you guys remember um, that initial diagram that we drew out between the imaging and the segmentation and creating of the STL file, uh, this is the breakdown between segmentation, which is creating that actual data set and the uh, variety of anatomies that we're interested in. The CAD prep is what it takes us to actually make that model into something that could be printable. The print prep is the part that takes us to actually kind of position it on the printer and make sure that the printer is not gonna fail when we try to do that model. And the post-processing is the other steps that it takes to actually do before delivering the model. And on average with the equipment that we currently have, it's about three hour print plus or minus on uh, sort of the average anatomy size that we're looking at. But beyond just the 3D printing, there's other ways that are maybe more digital and virtual versus physical that we've explored as well. And this is one of those examples. So this is an example for a left atrial appendage occlusion pre-procedural planning. So the model in blue is the right side of the heart and the model in red is the left side of the heart. And taking a look at it, how can we plan for particular anatomies? Well, this is the fossa where the transeptal puncture will be done. And what we can do is we can plan and take different catheters that are available clinically for the approach and say, what is the best catheter? So we start out with the right tools right away. Where do we puncture? So we create the right trajectory for it. And where is it gonna land us within the left atrial and the left atrial anatomy to do the best possible delivery and the best possible coplanar anatomy that we can uh, create and really just do one device delivery and be done. And if you think about it, this is where it comes to the cost effectiveness of how many devices you use and uh, how many catheters you use, but also it comes to just the patient and physician, how much radiation time are you gonna have? How much anesthesia time are you gonna have? And whether, let's say, doing a CT pre rather than TE is really the best option or not. And the examples of looking at it from the radiation standpoint, it's really very minimal radiation that CT creates compared to every minute that you do a fluoroscopy inside of the interventional procedure. Now, moving forward, uh, some of the other examples are the virtual and augmented reality. And I think from that part, we're still exploring and experimenting and trying to figure out what is the right tools. Some of the things that we've done internally have really been driven uh, by Kevin Key, who is upstairs in cardiology, has been instrumental in some of the work that we're doing. But here's some of the examples of what we call the mixed reality or uh, augmented reality that lets you an upper, that gives you an opportunity to have a digital model in front of you and manipulate it. And this is done actually with a $15 tool, which is very cheap. So we can broadcast it over a large population of physicians and allow them to have those files. Then you have augmented realities, uh, such as this next example that allows you to take the CT data set and just your phone or your tablet and interact with it digitally and see what that potentially looks like. Uh, and where some of the complicated volumetric problems could be, as well examples of the um, headsets that are out there that are standalone headsets and really could be placed within a physician office. We send you a file with your traditional model and then on your own time, you can do any kind of the planning that you're looking for. And what we've found is that although physical models are really great and you're able to do a nice interaction, a nice team interactions, the digital models are also very helpful. And the reason that they're very helpful is at the end of the day, the physical model in this world of cardiac anatomy only gives you a single phase and you're looking at it sort of at a slice of time versus a digital model, you can look at the dynamic interpretation of entire cardiac cycle and understand what happens to that anatomy between the systolic to diastolic phase and be able to downline to plan for some of those interventions with your physical tools such as catheters and valves and hopefully, let's say two, three years from now, actually be able to rehearse that procedure, place the device and see what the complications might be just for those complications and do it over and over again before you walk into a OR or a cath lab. So what have we done so far besides those prints and has been our footprint within this arena? Do you wanna start with that? Or? 
Perfect. So um, there's a couple of things that we've done. We've obviously tried to build out infrastructure, not just from the software standpoint, but for also from the hardware standpoint. So combined uh, between us now, between the local Seattle VA and University of Washington, we have about over 15 printers. There are different technologies. And what we've learned along the way is that a single technology doesn't really solve problems for everyone. And you sort of have to build into that infrastructure, variety of technology for a variety of different applications that could be different based on what your need is, whether that be pre-procedural planning or guides, and whether that be a flexible or hard model. And this is the other thing that we've been really working on is to be able to partner up and work with the industry providers, whether that be chemistry, biology, bioengineering, um, as well as just the 3D printers to bring in more equipment in-house that allows us to not just prototype, but also innovate some of the materials that need to exist on the medical side versus the engineering side. And this is where we're lucky to have the chemistry department next door. We've worked with them over the last several years, uh, UW Bioengineering, Engineering, and all those other uh, school departments that maybe have a lot more expertise on the material and equipment side of things that we do, but together there's a lot more that we can offer. And this is part of the um, collaboration that we've done between the VA and you doubt that we've formally released that allows us to use some of those tools, not just from a staffing perspective, but also from the equipment perspective and offer more for physicians on both sides. One of the exciting things about this is by putting together resources, Seattle is really on the map as one of the, the leaders in 3D printing. And so, you know, we really want to amplify that and that's through partnerships uh, with all of you to you know start using this technology more and figure out what we can do with it because i think we are really in a good position to really explode this field yeah the fact of how we're being, being recognized as seattle and northwest or whether that be presentations on the neurological side or the uh, ultrasound side or American Heart Association where we're participating in along all those entities and broadcasting the knowledge really that we've gotten over the last six, seven years. And this is an example of another thing that we did, which is in collaboration with UW Health Sciences Libraries, who have actually created a primer for virtual reality and how that needs to be done in case other institutions want to introduce it. Uh, and this was actually pretty successful. Again, a collaborative effort, not just from um, cardiologists, but also from surgeons, but also from mechanical engineering, and obviously the health sciences library stuff. So where do we want to go and what do we want to do with this maybe over the next two or three years uh, as we try to grow? You want me to talk about yeah. that? Sure. <laughs> so all innovations either make it or flop, right? And there's a hype cycle with everything. And I think early on for 3D printing, especially five years ago, it was a lot of hype. So all my classmates laughed at me. They said I was gonna live under a bridge in a couple of years. I, I, I don't really, but I could, it could happen, right? But yeah, this was just ridiculous and a waste of time. And to be honest, like at the beginning, I thought maybe it was too. But the more you do this and the more you see cases that really change how uh, the patient understands the disease or the clinician uh, approaches the disease or the, the anatomy, we realize, no, this is really important. This is fundamental. Um, and so I like to look at this hype cycle and think about where we are. So, you know, I'd say medical 3D printing was actually introduced 30 years ago, uh, but really started picking up six, seven years ago. And there's all this excitement and then they're like we're going to print organs we're going to print your heart you know by now we should have all had 3d printed hearts in us right like from how they say it and ears and this and that but so we get all this inflated expectations and then there's this trough of disillusionment like ah oh, this plastic thing it's not so great i can't do this i can't you know and then everyone kind of walks away from it but then a few people that believe in it keep going and here's what happens that's really important is Right now, GE, Siemens, Philips, like all of the major players have bought into this um, along with all of the engineering. So now we're getting second generation, third generation devices, software, um, applications and materials that really make this feasible. And so now we're kind of on this slope of enlightenment where we can really make this happen. And I think this 
luckily we're, we're kind of crazy. So we were on the ride from the beginning. So I think we're in a really good position here, but I, I really do believe that this is here to stay. And, you know, we've got category three CPT codes now for 3D printing as of June. Uh, we just got back from the RSNA, our radiological meeting. I mean, thousands of people working on this, looking at this, um, training on this. I don't think it's going away. Um, I think it, we're here to stay. And this is really the um, most exciting place to be on the curve because we can do a lot by working together and, and moving it forward. Part that we want to highlight maybe the most about all of this is the fact that it is a team effort. Uh, there's a lot of people that are involved along the way. They're not just clinicians, but they come from different walks of life. And I think that's what makes it powerful. The power comes from the, <coughs> the questions that we ask and the answers that we get. And the more questions that we ask, the more answers we can get and the more variability of what we can do becomes. And the big great example of that is one of the things that um, Dr. Ripley is doing on the bioprinting side of things and uh, kind of looking at what could be some of the things that could be done immediately versus the things that we could do over the next five years. So do you want to speak to that for a second? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, of course, I'm just trying to scare away everyone, but we do have a bioprinter now that is accessible to you all. Um, we are trying to start small. We're not trying to print a whole heart right now. We're trying to print um, vascularized bone as a first pass, but we do have those resources. And I do think in the next two to five years, we will see some advances there. I think we just have to be smart about what we do, but any and all of you are welcome to come over and check out the printer and use it because who knows what it could do. And, uh... Just wanted to say thank you to, again, the team effort that has helped us out along the way with the 3D printing, maybe from asking and doing different cases or just uh, <coughs> coming up with other ideas of what we can do within the 3D printing arena or any kind of the, again, augmented imaging that could be added clinically and be able to be helpful for what you're doing. I'll just make one more in a second. I go back to uh, Rob McClellan. Um, you know, Rob, when we first uh, came to uh, New Dunham a couple of years ago, I was really gracious enough to provide us the opportunity to compose a lot of this and, and support us. I just want to thank you for that. Uh, any questions? Yeah. So um, I, I think from the imaging standpoint, that's definitely an interest for a lot of people coming from this week, RSMA, the, radio, <coughs> the Radiological Society meeting. There's definitely interest from the, <coughs> excuse me, from GE and Philips and Siemens, these big players, to try to figure out how do we take that three-dimensional data set that comes as a gated CT anyways, and what can we do with it? And I think part of it is um, the other modalities virtual and augmented realities that are trying to think more about clinical aspect of things versus just the um, gaming aspect that will allow us to create some of those data sets to think about that. So I don't think this is something that is going to be here within the next six months, but probably within the next 12 to 18 months is definitely something that people are going to be unlocking a lot more of. But we can do it now. Right. So... So yes, it will be more widespread in the next six to 18 months, but uh, Dimitri's just being modest because he's been doing it. We've been doing it for the last, what, three or four months yep. um, in, in virtual reality. You can bring icons and you can bring X and see a beating heart. And you can stop, so you can go through, play that heart, beating heart, 
Uh, we've been looking at this for Watchmen because, you know, the, the left atrial appendage changes shape and morphology over time. So we can actually play that, pause it uh, where we want. And through collaborations Dimitri's done, you can actually now measure. So you can measure on multiple time frames within that part. And we're working to, right now to validate. If we want to go back to the validation for making these measurements. So it's true, it's not ready for prime time yet, but we are quite close with that. So we're, we're getting there. I think that's a fantastic point, and I think we definitely need to go that way. Um, right now, we sort of just been scrambling. We're we're a, a lean team, so we kind of scramble on the, the patient cases, and we've been really focused on what can we do right now for the patients in front of us, and how can we do different by training to um, push that forward. But there is a, a huge opportunity for the education aspect of this. We've done a little bit with the, the medical team and putting them into virtual realities. I think there's more, and I think that's a huge part of it. So even what we saw with um, Josh Nelson, you know, getting his residents a chance to operate on an HCM case before they actually go in um, makes a big difference. Yes. 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 New technology increasing the cost of health How do you see this playing out and how are you going to test that? <laughs> do you want to take it? Do you want to yeah, take no, it? We, uh, <laughs> we recently, uh, the launch of the was great. Uh, we had failed all that particular day and uh, uh, subsequently we modeled it um, and then we did it again. Um, and we completely different catheter <laughs> position of the transeptal puncture. Uh, and we were going to deploy the device and actually there was a live case that was one of the large meetings that was unfortunately very successful and uh, that roadmap was super helpful. So if you're looking at the launch of this device, most of the procedures um, with one and a half devices for people to size them, uh, they take uh, what we call these captures where you position them properly for a longer time in the cap lab or for a more expensive contract. So I think uh, refining the procedures I think is important. Benefit the overall cost. And typically, uh, the devices are in price and in such a way as there's no negative in, in, um, in cost savings. How do you see this playing out differently? Well, I'm going to push back on that. No, perfectly hard. If you go into a procedure and you fail, that's a huge cost. If you go on a procedure and you're successful, not only from the standpoint of the cost that, that that brings to you and the reimbursement associated with the cost that you have, it also brings um, a positive benefit to the patient. That's more difficult to, to monetize, but I, I think that if you go into these situations where you know what you're going to use, it's going to be successful. You don't have to have three trips to the cap on to get this out. So, um, and each one of those has a cost, not only to the institution, but to society at large. So I think this does give you the ability to, to be more, but your success rate is going to be much higher, particularly more complicated places. And the only other thing, so with that, I, I mean, since I've got a little bit of the floor right now, I think I think that people go into imaging, cath labs, radiology, echo, et cetera, et cetera, have mentioned the very early slide that 3D sort of part of your brain. Mm -hmm. I think we're able to take the meat, the boy will eat, we're able to take some of that 2D data set. In our brains, we can we can manipulate that and kind of figure this out. However, I think back to what Catherine was saying a moment ago, being able to take people who perhaps don't have that maybe in the ability or ability to sort of do that and bring them up to speed back to the teaching aspects of this. We've all been through gross anatomy. 
I mean, that's a, that's a pretty static image. Um, but taking this kind of information and being able to, to elevate people's understanding of what they're looking at very rapidly, I think it's, a, it's absolutely something that should be looked at in terms of teaching, not, not only in medical school, but as we go along and we're trying to explain these concepts. So I think that's all to you guys. I think this is, from my perspective, very early work, but nonetheless, something very, very important for, for the number of us. And I think the drone center Well, and I think we do have, just to speak to that really quickly, we have some early uh, evidence that it really does save costs, and has good return on investment, a few things. I mean, you can talk about billing, and we're trying to get there, but really, um, if you're bundling care or you're doing accountable care, you know, you don't want to open five catheters or for two bells. I mean, we do have data that has shown that you can go from 1.8 to 1.2 Watson devices. I'm not sure how much they cost, but I would say that's probably. There we go. Okay, $17,000, and it's what, maybe $100 for the $50 to print the model. The other thing that we've seen is for our surgeries, we can decrease over time by a couple hours. You do that enough time, you start to. Book your OR times in a more reliable way, knowing you're not going to have patients over. You have increased access, so that's something that we care about a lot about at UCLA, and I know we care about here too, right? So, um, access, patient satisfaction, um, faster recoveries, and saving um, costs. And then the other really interesting thing that you mentioned is start thinking about quality reimbursements and how are they going to quantify quality? Well, this is a really clear way that we could say to CMS, look, this is quality because we have planned. So I think that's going to factor into how we build this. I think that's really true. And the part about the cost of those patients as well, this really gets into the larger idea that we should have more simulation, both in medical training, but also as you're doing. I think the problem is that, at least right now, it's probably part of the sales intervention and spending, I don't know how much time doing the procedure or the operation on your 3D printed model or in virtual 3D reality before you even go in there and do something. And that may take a culture change to do that. And that may take some CMS inducement for quality purposes to do that. And, and you guys talk to the sim lab at all or talk to the not so much about the previous of the but but about kind of the general or whole idea of how to integrate this sort of thing yeah, so we had some uh, very initial discussions on this. Part of the question is how different, like you mentioned, what we're doing versus what maybe they're trying to address is a single model that is over and over and over and over again versus what we're trying to do is really clinical care where we go one off, one off, one off, one off. So I definitely think there's uh, some um, relationships that can be built along the way, and I think the strengths are in the curriculum that we could potentially put around it, but also at the same time, maybe to give um, the perspective to the audience, I'm going to call on a couple of users that have used this technology, and maybe they can give quickly their perspective. So, Dr. Timer. Um, so, I went to the
The, the thing is, I don't think it, and you should comment too, but I, I, from what I've seen, it doesn't take a very long time for the interventionalist to interact with the model. It actually was really disappointing for me at first because I made these crazy things and then people pick it up and be like, yeah, okay, I got it. But if that's the point, then I realized, no, that's good, right? They get it and they get it and like, what's in a minute? Versus how many times do you come down to our page and look at the images, you know, so. Send her to cardiac surgery with the attendant you know, recovery time and expensive of that and, and for, for, for uh, what the lost uh, economic uh, uh, cost to her family and society in general. And so, if we can come up with tools and techniques that allow us to avoid uh, more expensive and traditional surgical intervention, you know, I think that's a huge win right there. And, and there's been numbers of instances where uh, good cost analyses have been done to look at the, the difference in cost um, to, uh, of intervention procedures versus <laughs> in the general world. On average, the cost is not that high. I mean, I'm not talking about charging, I'm talking about the actual hospital cost. You get rid of all the hospital, you get rid of all the hotel charges, everything else that goes into days in the ICU. That all goes away. And so um, there, that would be one opportunity, and I think a little one proof to look at cost savings. Thank you. 
we're using is actually the time. I think that would be really, really the next step. Talk about that. Let's watch this. But yeah, I think that's uh, that's definitely something that we're considering. Obviously, devices that can be tricky when it comes down to developing them. But that is something that we're trying to do mechanical engineering and talking to some of the faculty team on board to say, what can we do and how can we improve that moving forward, um, as well as some of the advances again in equipment that we can do and partners and collaboration with institutions such as VA. Uh, well, and I think also just getting back to the point that everyone's been making, we have this rich data set now of real anatomy. And when you go into, you know, tested device, you may have 10 cadaveric patients and hopefully they match the actual patient population. Sometimes they do, a lot of times they don't. So what happens when we can now give device developers real-time data sets that match exactly the patients they want? Um, how much better will the devices be? And I don't know, but I, I would guess the answer is going to be significantly better. <laughs>